uh, <laughs> socialism and some good things like when education works, that's because of socialism. Yeah. The VA and Medicare work because of socialism. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy, the Populist Dialogues. I am your host today, Dr. Don Baham, filling in for David Doak who's kind of under the weather. And the title of today's show is Cooperative Governance. And my guest is Alex Linsker. Is that the correct pronunciation? It is. Yeah, well, I've got that right this first time. Here you are. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. How are you feeling right now? I feel great. Great. How are you doing? You're not nervous? No. You did it to me again. Yeah, usually, I'm the only one nervous anymore when a new guest oh. comes aboard. But anyhow, I'm fine. I'm just fine. I'm teasing you. Uh, so, why are we here talking to each other? Um, so David had asked me to talk about cooperative governance. David Delk, our boss, yeah. Yeah. Cooperative so, governance. So, yeah. cooperatives, um, David talked about better behaved corporations. So what if a corporation is run democratically, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are, um, and the success rate, so businesses that start, they're twice as likely to succeed and stay in business if they're cooperatively run. And so w the way we have cities and countries democratic, what if companies are democratic? So REI, um, to buy uh, outdoor sporting gear, uh -huh. members have a vote. Oh. Uh, food co-ops. Yes. A lot of people go to food co-ops and buy food and decide how it's run. And everything from credit unions to Sunkist, the orange juice company. Yes. It's a bunch of orange growers. They got together and they named themselves Sunkist and they decide how it's run. And those are working better than those that are run for just for corporate profits. On average, it's oh, a lot better. Oh, yeah. Son of a gun. How did you learn all of that? Um, originally, I got into. I was working at a electronics company. We sold TVs on the internet, and I was doing marketing. And I wrote some text, and someone else wrote, made, got some images, and someone else did the layout on the web page. And I said, this looks terrible. It was sort of assembly line style, sort of pass it down. Someone else does the next step. Yeah. And I went to the president of the company, and I'd already gotten him some results. And I said, what if we get a team of six of us together, all these different departments, and we meet, and we decide what to do? And he said, I'll have to approve it. And I said, well, that'll make it a lot harder to work if, we, if you have to agree on everything. And, I, and he said, you'll never agree on anything. Sure, if the six of you agree, you can do it. So I wrote up a project management, wrote up a plan of what to do for two weeks, got us together, we agreed on it, we made some changes, got rid of some stuff, which was great. Uh -huh. um, and we decided what to do, and then two weeks later, we had these 20 new web pages up, and I was told after that it normally would have taken nine months at that company. And so profits went up, um, and they were able to sell the company later on, which, so it was good for business. So yeah. it was a success. It was a success, yeah. How'd you get that kind of thinking power going? Where'd you come from? I don't know. My background's originally in theater. Um, theater? So I did some acting, mostly producing, uh, some writing. And so the idea of improvisation, you uh, have a, some notes on a script, and uh -huh. you work off the notes, and it's kind of like having a constitution or a kind of a governance. You say, when something happens, here's what we do next. But usually, you make lots of choices on your own. Uh, uh, <laughs> confession. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I did on stage was driving Miss Daisy. Oh, yeah. He, uh, that was about 10 years ago. But I had to give up stage work because my wife said she was going to divorce me because I was away oh. from home all the time. So we have something in common there, too. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Theater. Yeah. Yes. So back to cooperative governance, we were going to talk about a little of uh, what I might offer you to talk about. Then you can take the lead. We'll just uh, dialogue. OK and see where it takes us, all right? Yeah. Uh, the Oregon Constitutional Amendment you're working on. You're working on an Oregon Constitutional Amendment. Will yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, so there's a new group that I started. It's called Tax and Conversation. Tax and Conversation. Yeah. Interesting name. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so working on a statewide amendment in Oregon, and it's on tax reform. And the ideas just kept getting simplified and better. And so end all tax exceptions. And then everyone gets $700 a month as a cash refund in their bank account every month. Just by re revising that kind of radical uh, reorganization or yeah. revising? Yeah. So right now in Oregon, we have the uh, general fund. And that's where the legislature gets to make most of their choices on where the budget goes. Mm -hmm. And that's $7.5 billion a year. 
and tax exceptions just out of the general fund, six billion a year. So it's almost one to one. Um, and then we can't change federal law in Oregon, but we can tax the difference in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So it comes to a lot of money. It comes to $24 billion a year in tax exemptions is the technical word. So credits, deductions, different giveaways. And the vast majority of that money goes to people with the most money, uh, which is a lot of people, but everyone would have on average $700 a month if it was equally given away. Do you think the citizenry will be happy with that? People I'm talking with are happy with that, <laughs> yeah. You're going to have any success with that effort? I think so. And there's also going to be trying to figure out, still have a year more of research to go, been working on it for seven months, how much is needed for quality core government services, education, health care, environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it seems like a few billion dollars there, big numbers. But people are happy with it. And I just, my style is to talk with lots of people and get input from lots of people. And we're set up with this uh, democratic governance style, so we have weekly civics meetings on Thursday, Thursdays, uh, 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And people can come to those, and members give input and say, what about this? You should change this. So that's how it's been going, and revi a lot of revisions. And when they say, well, what makes you think you can do this? You go back and say, well, look what we did with Sunkist. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't do Sunkist. I started a place yeah, called yeah. Collective Agency yeah. in Old Town Portland. And it's a, it's a workplace. The industry is called co-working. And that's a, that's a trend with companies. So people share a workplace. Uh, we're the only one I know of where it's democratically decided. Some members can change rates. Uh, we have a constitution for our little workplace. Uh, Mozilla's based there. Um, other companies, much smaller, are based there. Uh, Nike and Intel have off-site meetings there. It's, it has a good feel to it, good vibes. Man, you're really you're yeah. moving ahead here, yeah. It's fun. 21st yeah. century and a half. It's fun. Yeah. So what are the obstacles in your goal? Yeah, um, making sense of all the numbers for tax and conversation has been a really big obstacle. And people say the tax code is complex. And what I've learned is that means we don't want you to understand how it works. <laughs> Does it have to be complex? It doesn't. It can be really simple. Um, really? So there's, f there's more than 400 different exceptions. Um, 370-something are written up in a booklet that the uh, governor and the uh, Oregon Department of Revenue print. And it's a really well-written booklet. But you have to read and exceptions. understand. <laughs> yeah, all these exemptions, exceptions. Um, exemptions, yeah. And it just comes, I've been talking with people. I talked with a guy who gets uh, farm worker housing credits. And I was asking him, what about these? And he says, if there's a budget item for this, that would be better than these exceptions. Sure. Yeah. So when you're done with your approach, mm -hmm. instead of about how many, 300 and there's, the, there's about 400. About 400. Yeah. How many will we have when you're finished? It'll be closer to 10. Oh, so you're kidding me. Some of the Constitution <laughs> already, yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I wish you luck. I, uh, what's the time frame you're looking at if you're successful in every step of the way, or nearly every step of the way from now on? Yeah, uh, so we're uh, doing research, and members are signing up, paying a percent of income as a member fee, and that supports the work and pays for staff, and keep getting input for another year. And then around January, the more, the more normal part of the political process starts. We get signatures. Um, a separate group does a petition committee, gets signatures, and then um, we'll be on with uh, gay marriage and some other things up for voters. Mm -hmm. And in uh, November 2014, if more than half of Oregonians decide this is good, then it'll become law. How many members do you have now? Um, we, have, we, only, we only have around 10 members so far, but it's been good enough and hope to get 1,000. And yeah. you expect you will be getting 1,000? I huh? do. Uh, without mentioning names, what size uh, companies are you talking about or members? Um, it's actually individuals. So individuals. People who are better informed or more likely to sign up, people who know what's going on with tax policy, mm -hmm. and people of all income levels from, I think, 10000 to hundreds of thousand dollars a year are members already. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's good enough, and more people makes it better, and different political figures are starting to consider lending their name to it, and that'll help with everything. How are you getting the money to carry on this effort? Um, it's all from member fees. So, so someone earning 10000 a year only pays $73, and someone earning $150,000 
a year pays 3400 So it's kind of like a progressive tax. Are you some sort of a socialist? I like socialism. We have uh, <laughs> socialism and some good things like when education works, that's because of socialism. Yeah. The VA and Medicare work because of socialism. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why hasn't this been done before, this constitutional amendment where you reduce the, the, the ten uh, <laughs> exceptions to the tax code? Yeah. Um, Why hasn't it been done before? Yeah, I had met with um, Jody Weiser of Tax Fairness Oregon. Oh, she's good. Yeah, I've been mentored and been going to meetings. I'm going to go after after I talk with you. Mm -hmm. They have weekly meetings. Um, and first time I talked with her for a couple hours, I realized afterwards we talk about tax and it's sort of, there's, we're defensive on two fronts. There's a state level and it can get more aggressive and it does. And there's a federal level. And actually income tax, when you include the exceptions, it's regressive. So that people with the most money pay less percent of tax. Well, isn't that fair? Corporations create jobs. <laughs> and the whole <laughs> thing, the whole fair. thing, yeah, <laughs> whole thing with job creation. It's like taking a religious <laughs> word, create. We don't have a cake creator. We have bakers, and we, we don't have, we don't have uh, education creators. We have teachers. So we have uh, so people running companies can hire people working. If they can lose a job, then when you're hired, you're making a job. And when we pay tax dollars, the government's the biggest employer in Oregon, by far. Mm -hmm. 300,000 government employees in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I go to the corner store and buy some orange juice, I'm, I'm a job creator as a, as a customer. <laughs> yeah, okay, I should so, have asked that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we talked about where the money will come from. Yeah. And who would be uh, against this constitutional amendment uh, for Oregon? Who would yeah. be against it? Yeah. Um, it seems like. Everyone I talk to says it'll be good for people, and that's where I've started, and that's been my, been my first question. Um, and my other question is, what's the total tax each person pays? Because normally we politicize tax, and we say state, federal, payroll. So just look at one number, total, total tax on income. And I think people against it are either people, when I've talked with people, some people have expressed concerns that the world might end would be an overstatement. Um, <laughs> if we make this change, the world might end. And to that I would say, we increased the number of exceptions by $4 billion a year in Oregon since 2009, and really no one's noticed. Um, and as a total amount of money, that's 29%, but a lot of that we can't even, we can't tax. So there's half the amount of the general fund, we've done more giveaways, and no one's really noticed. And big changes keep happening, so good changes can also happen. Um, and the other thing is, perhaps big companies might not want to pay more tax. Perhaps they'll run a negative ad campaign. But I've also gotten feedback that this is too positive for companies to risk their brand doing negative ads on. So that's a concern of mine. We'll see what happens. So tax is a, a swear word, a pejorative, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And if we could uh, change uh, the average American's way of thinking when you mention tax, perhaps you wouldn't have such resistance. Yeah, and I think the biggest, I talked with a guy early on who used to work, uh, he used to clean water out of the basement of one of the US flagships. Um, and he was saying, when you talk about tax, he says, you gotta talk about what is tax, just to find the basic words. So tax is a fee for services provided yes. to society. Mm -hmm. And so w usually we don't even think about those services too much when we're, when we're blaming tax for stuff. So education, we need money for that. Um, about half the jobs in Oregon from government, half of the 300,000 jobs are for teachers and related jobs. Mm -hmm. And then there's things like health care. So life essential and preventative care, it's a good thing. Environment, we're actually cutting down more trees in Oregon to bring in tax revenue. And what you're saying sounds innocuous and even pleasant enough because you didn't say taxes. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I think part of the, people talk about the burden of taxes, and I think for me the burden is all these little numbers that add up and aren't understood, and we have all these things like marg top marginal tax rate, just these very confusing ways of thinking about it. So I'd like to just at least be able to look up yeah. on a, type on a, on a calculator or a computer, just type in how much you've made that year and get one number back, and we can do that. What are you going to do with Salem with this idea? The government, Salem? the government in Salem. So politicians that I've been meeting are really smart and they know lots of people and it's great to get advice from them. At the same time, it doesn't depend on anyone in official government because this will be the initiative process. So it'll be a vote the to the people. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, don't they have ways of uh, uh, affecting or changing the initiative process if they find that something is going to pass that's going to diminish their importance or their power? There's different ways of passing laws, and so a lot of the research has been on the economics and what can we do that's proactive to stop other laws from making this less effective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of research, and I've hired my first constitutional lawyer and need to hire some more, um, getting advice on how does this actually work, how does the reality work in, in Salem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How was tax and uh, conversion funded? Did we talk about that yet? Uh, we did, so the yeah. number of fees. Yeah. yeah. So what else would be useful for the viewers to hear concerning uh, cooperative governance? Yeah. I think the biggest thing for me about cooperative governance and running a, a democratic company or state or city is um, so, so collective agency in Old Town, that was the fourth uh, cooperative business that I've started. Tax and Conversations, the fifth. The fifth? Yeah. And so, so the first, uh, so all of them are, all, all of those five are either, four of them are still going, one was sold. And the biggest thing I found is stating what your expectations are. And I like to call those community guidelines. Mm -hmm. In the US, we call them Bill of Rights. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of, so at least when you start, so what do you expect? So at Collective Agency, own responsibility for your actions was the first um, community guideline. And the community guidelines there were actually adopted. Someone else had been running it before, more as an LLC, more as a privately owned business. Mm -hmm. And she had written up these amazing community guidelines. So own responsibility for your actions, and that means you can't just say it's someone else's fault. If you've done something, say you did it. Um, be responsible. And for, uh, for Tax and Conversation, my favorite is uh, every person is worthy of love and belonging in this group, which, which is kind of uh, human. And, but I've just found in a lot of political talk about tax, there's a lot of tendency to, to blame other people or use labels. Yeah. And that's not my style. I really want everyone to be part of this if they want to. Um, so ask for what you want is the community guidelines. Yeah, make it explicit, write it out. Are you going to run for public office? I like what I'm doing, and I'm term limited to eight years at, at Tax and Conversation. <laughs> um, after tax reform, there's all kinds of things affected by tax in Oregon, education reform, universal health care in Oregon. I hope, I hope someone does that first. Um, <laughs> I really want that. So what did you do before you got uh, involved in this particular activities? Yeah. How did you feed yourself? Yeah. Um, I did, so originally theater producing and then marketing. For a few years I did, it's called Retail Anthropology, and I kind of have a very anthropology approach. There's a book, Why We Buy, and uh, basically I worked for that company and going to the biggest stores, Microsoft, Subway Sandwiches, REI, and interview customers, interview employees, say, what do you like, what could be even better? Usually there's a mission of increasing sales and making the customer experience better. Um, looking how people shop. Um, I've done a lot of website. It's called user experience. So when mm -hmm. someone comes to a website, where do they click? What are your goals? Mm -hmm. um, and then from that, I got into this, these cooperatives. Well, the, well, the results yeah. of your research, wh what do you do with that? How, how yeah. is it uh, put together? Yeah, so in stores, a lot of times it's about signage. That's usually the simplest way of making a difference. And a lot of times people running the government, um, say in uh, Office Depot or Office Max, I forget which one, there was a restroom sign and I asked the, an employee and he says, it's over there, why don't people ever understand where the restroom is? There's a big sign. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't see it, he knew it was there. Mm -hmm. But he works there and we didn't know it was there as customers. Mm -hmm. So helping the store governance say, hey, you need to make that sign, either lower it, uh, make it bigger, uh, change uh, the color, do something because people don't, don't get it. So make it so people get it. It takes a special kind of thinking to do that kind of research. It's just delightful. Yeah, yeah. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in, uh, in New York. I went to New York University. And they said the city's your campus. And I really loved going out and doing theater back then and learning from all these different groups. Yeah. OK. So we've still got some more time yet. I wonder what can we talk about that or have people understand a little better about cooperative governance that we haven't mentioned yet. What would you talk? Yeah. A lot of times when I talk with people about cooperative governance, 
it's a question of who starts it. And in my experience, sometimes other people have started it. Um, usually it starts within an existing company or within an existing structure. Um, so the first one I was at was at NYU. It was a, uh, there were some student organizations. One was doing theater and film, mm -hmm. getting jobs for, uh, for actors and for crew. Mm -hmm. There was a guy, Paul Surti, he had the brilliant idea. This was back in 1999. Had an email list that we had all these bulletin boards around back when that was the thing. He said, put, put all the jobs on one email and people can sign up if they're an actor for acting jobs, if they're on crew for lighting and technical jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did that and we got a thousand members in the first year. And I, I designed some marketing for it. We put up some posters and people would come in and there was a community started, kind of this co-working, like the most recent business I started. We had people come in and you'd have directors looking through headshots, um, calling people up and hiring them. We had uh, people talking about producing a show. Uh, you'd have someone working on a computer. You'd have all these different things and this variety and you'd get advice and there's mentoring. Um, so that's how I got into it. Um, someone else started it and I loved it. So how far away are we from the initiative being available for people to sign? Yeah. Um, so in a, in a year, in uh, January, February, it'll be available for people to sign. And until then, there's a website, taxandconversation.com. Taxandconversation.com. And people can go to that, and they can see our mission on the homepage, and they can see a draft of the amendment, and they can see, they can sign up and become a member, they can come to events. So we're doing research for, it'll be a year and a half total, another year to go. <laughs> That's unusual, but it's really fun. So if people want to uh, lend their name to it, that'll be great. Uh -huh. People inspire other people. So You're ambitious. It's fun, yeah. I love it. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, tax and conversation, cooperative governance. So we don't have cooperative governance now, for the most part, in our, in our economic system. Yeah, we don't. We have much less than we used to, and privately owned banks are get bringing in far more profits than they used to. So we're act actually, in that way, we're worse than the uh, Great Depression in terms of economic really? inequality. We're worse than the Great Depression right now. And so there's a lot of firms. Um, I printed out these uh, seven cooperative principles. Do you want to tick them off or not? Yeah, sure. Um, and seven so cooperative principles. Yeah, and wherever someone works, you can get a little bit more cooperative at your business. So whether you're working at, th there's a lot of cooperatives already. So Ace Hardware Store, um, it's, it's my favorite store. I kind of have a crush on Ace Hardware. Uh -huh. I go there, I buy my broom or my cleaning supplies. Um, and Ace Hardware, it's um, each store owner, a lot of times a family owns a store, and they buy into this uh, marketing cooperative. They buy into the name Ace. They make decisions democratically on how things are done. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a lot of groups in Portland, so um, First Unitarian is a uh, democratically run congregation. Yes. There's a lot of uh, fellowships, which are democratically run religious groups. Mm -hmm. uh, Reform Judaism is often democratically run, mm -hmm. Quakers. Mm -hmm. So the first cooperative, uh, buying oatmeal was really expensive back in the day. So a bunch of people got together, a bunch of weavers. They were making clothes and they said, we want to buy oatmeal. So they chipped in their money, they got a lower price. And that was the f one of the first cooperatives. <laughs> You've done your homework very well. I have. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to be looking forward to what's going to be happening in the future with this I initiative. Uh, it seems uh, the, the kinds of uh, uh, efforts that people like you are making, it seems like more often than not, they don't succeed because of the resistance of the existing system that is successful for those with the money and the power today. and They don't want to see any change. Yeah. So that's why I got to wish you luck okay. and help you and support you any way that I can. Yeah. Do you, uh, who else is involved with you? Is there somebody else working with you now? Yeah, so there's a, uh, a coordinating council. Um, so uh, Sherry Anderson, she's a business coach. She works with teams at Nike. Mm -hmm. and Rish Inanna, who's uh, very young and self-taught, and so they're, the, they're council members. And so that's one of our houses of governance in tax and conversation. And then members come to these weekly civics meetings as much as they want to, and they can vote online or come in person. And so 
so that's who the governance is right now. Mm -hmm. And it seems like other groups are, I've been told, they're thinking about signing on. So it really seems just like once a few people start doing it, it'll be good. And because a lot of things like this do fail, I've been looking at how do we make this work? Yeah. And so, so how much money will we need for an ad campaign? That's the question. And so just figure out how much it is and then get it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Who chose that name? Um, tax and conversation. I did after, uh, so it's tax and not taxes, and it's conversation and not something else. Uh -huh. I was just looking at, I talked with a lot of people, and that seemed to be a good name. Interesting, quite an interesting yeah. name. Now, we're running, we have about another minute and 20 seconds or so, and I wonder what it is you can say to our viewers that would be useful uh, for them to hear from you in, in considering what we talked about and yeah. what you're about. Yeah. Um, I think look at a cooperative governance online and you can see these seven principles. Um, democratic governance is one of them. Um, surplus belongs to members is another. Mm -hmm. And then tax and conversation. Um, our symbol is an ampersand for, uh, for the word and. Mm -hmm. And some people say it looks like a rocking chair um, also. But if you go on the website, if you read through, we've put the text there, we've put our what we expect there. Um, sign up on the newsletter. Uh, give some input. Tell what you think. Say how it could be even better. Uh, refer people to become members. There's a calculator. Uh, type in your income and see your fee. Probably less than you expect. If it's more, then it should be worth it. That's a commercial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a good way to start. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for coming on. It was interesting visiting with you. Thanks for having me. We had a populist dialogue. Yes. <laughs> okay. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for populist dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. We want to thank the crew for getting us on the air again. Thank you to Joan Horton, Janet Morris, Beth Kerwin, Roger Bates, Dave King, and Brad Leach. Thank you also to the staff here at Portland Community Media for the use of studio space and equipment. And thank you, the audience. I hope that you will watch us again in the future. Thank you. <laughs>